screen. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. So, it was an awesome week. I got to go to Detroit, Michigan, where it was even warmer. I mean, colder. I mean, not, well, it was just as lovely as it is here. Um, celebrated 10 years with my company, got my watch. You know, it made me feel special and appreciated, which is always fun. Got back late Friday night. Saturday, we have three showings in our home scheduled. We had to be out of our house early. We had to drive to Cedar Rapids, white knuckle it back last night from Cedar Rapids so we could be here today. And we're here in one piece. And thank you, Lord, for your protection, for your provision. Um, you know, I know I've shared with you how excited I am for 2017 and blessings are manifesting. Um, we know where we want to build our new home. We have been given an opportunity that one of my clients called me and said, hey, I know of an opportunity. It happens to be right next door to my house. <laughs> Not public yet, but if you're interested, walk out the front door, it's the city. Walk out the backyard, it's like you're in the country. It's perfect, only we don't have to mow that much. <laughs> so feeling blessed, favored, um, you know, things change. I, I'm one of the, there's three project managers at my firm, and the one that's directly above me just resigned. And that means that all of her clients go somewhere. Um, so my business plan just doubled. <laughs> and the blessings that come from more responsibility are soon to follow um, and all the work. <laughs> but I'm telling you guys, blessings are manifesting. And, um, you know, I, I, as I was praying this morning, I was, I, I was just hoping that there would be a church full of people because the Spirit is pouring out right now. The Spirit is pouring out if we are just open to listen and to receive. And I'm telling you, I mean, so this morning the Lord was talking to me about barrenness. Barrenness comes before the promise. Yes. And it is hard to wait in that time of barrenness. But then the promise comes. But then there's the struggle of birthing. And I feel like the time of barrenness is done and we're in the struggle of birthing right now. And I'm telling you, the promise is on its way. It has to manifest. It has to manifest. And so, um, you know, I was thinking about um, Abraham and Sarah who just laughed at the impossibility of what God promised and said will come to pass. And it came to pass, even though she laughed. I'm telling you, God wants to bless us more than we can think or imagine. And so, of course, um, this morning, the Lord reminded me about Isaiah 54. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not break, bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. Thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen the cord, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth. I don't know about anybody else's youth, but there are some things to forget. Mm -hmm. And shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. We will not even remember the barren times, the struggles. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the child, the God of the whole earth, he shall be called. For the Lord hath, hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith the Lord. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the water of Noah to me, unto me, for I have sworn for I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that hath mercy on thee. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted. Behold, I will lay the stones with fair colors, and lay the foundations with sapphires. I will make thy widows of agates and thy gates, windows of agates, sorry, of agate, and thy gate of carbuncles, and all thy borders of pleasant stones. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, and for it shall not come near thee. 
Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals on the, in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the waster to destroy. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Amen. There's, um, there's a song. Um, let me see if I can pull up the lyrics. Um, that that um, There's a song that I have been uh, just meditating on. It's called Let There Be Light. When you speak... Darkness has to bow. Confusion has its final hour. When you speak, mountains rise and fall. It tears down every wall around me. When you speak, breathe upon the dust. You come alive in us. When you speak, you silence every fear. We feel your spirit here around us. Let there be light until it fills up every space. Come and have your way. Let there be light, just one word, and I am changed. Come and have your way. Now, I know we say it all the time, but his word has to come out of our mouth. Yes. And I'm telling you, it is time to say to the darkness, let there be light. Let yes. there be light. My spirit was screaming this morning, let there be light. And I'm not talking about the sun. I'm talking about the darkness and the, the soul, mm -hmm. the dark night of the soul, the darkness, the heaviness of the spirit that has been oppressing the church. Let there be light. Let these things cease. Let the mountains be cast away. Let all things be made whole. It is the time to reap the promises. It is the time to speak to things and watch those mountains be removed. So anyway, be bold. Let there be light. When we see darkness, when we encounter darkness, speak to it. You know, I just really feel like the Lord, we come to him sometimes, and he's like, why are you speaking to me about it? He has given us every tool, every authority, all of the power that he has already abides in us. Until we have wisdom to move and to act, yes, we wait, and we wait for him to renew us and to give us that wisdom. But when you know what you know, that you know what the promise is, what the answer is, speak it out. And do not let the enemy continue to lie and have his way. And he is a busy bee right now because he knows his days are numbered. And as the church is strengthened and as the people of the body of Christ are empowered, things are about to dramatically change. And um, I just encourage you all to be ready and hang on because blessings are going to overtake us in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus name. Amen. You know, I, I, until I read that this morning, Nathan, I forgot that that was a promise. That scripture, that, yeah, yeah that chapter was a promise to you, and I just remember that. So the Lord oh, wants you to know he has heard every one of your prayers, and it is his good pleasure to bless you Thank beyond you. measure. We love our pastor. <laughs> I love you, Nathan. <laughs> I'm very thankful that you're our pastor. Yes, yes Don. You know what, what you said about Brother Nathan?
Um, sharing something a friend of mine was asking if anybody you know had words for 2017 so I was sharing and there was a lot of conversation after encouraging word and um, one of the sons of Joe I don't know where I don't know Joe don't know where Joe's from but he's uh, he's a believer but he struggled with addiction and it's hard when you struggle with those kind of things to feel like you're still on track and he struggled with thoughts of suicide and so I was able to kind of encourage him and minister him to him. But there's so many people in the body that feel like they're just not good enough. And I think as a church, I mean, you know, yeah, there's people that don't even know church, but the people in the church, we need to just really reach out. I mean, we have people here that struggle with certain things. And, you know, and, and I'm sure when in, in their struggles, they feel like they can't come. They don't feel like they're worthy to come. They, don't, they feel like a hypocrite if they come. And this is the one place that they need to be the most, to be loved on and not judged. Who of us have lived perfect lives without judgment, you know? But we, um, you know, just to remember those who struggle with any sort of addiction, struggle with anything that would try to lie, because the enemy gets in their ear and tells them, who are you to go to church? Who are you to sit and raise your hand and praise the Lord? Who are you? You, you put him on the cross. We all put him on the cross. And he chose to come and humble himself. I just, there are all these Christmas songs talking about the little tiny baby. You know, and um, I uh, randomly uh, heard a Brad Paisley song. He wrote it when he was 13 about this important baby. And he said, the world thought you'd come in as a knight clad in armor, but you came as a little baby. So hush, little baby. You know, you're going to give such joy. And I just thought, wow, the message that we had to share can be grasped so beautifully by a 13-year-old boy. It's so simple, and we try to make it complicated, and we, we worry, you know, where are they at with their, with their theology and their understanding? They just need to know about this important little baby. This important little baby, God, humbled himself and had to go through all of the stuff that we do as a little baby and, and redeemed us all forever and eternity. Gave himself for us all. Yeah, Sheila. Uh, request prayer for Lily who's having a lot of issues. She's a morbidly obese uh, niece of hers is just having many, many health issues. So she asked for prayer for that situation. We have a 14
14-year-old young lady staying with us right now. Her parents are, well, you guys remember I used to, re used to request prayer for Angel that died on yeah. dialysis. Yeah. Yeah, it's their daughter. Uh, mom and dad are currently in a really bad uh, situation home-wise, so she asked me if I would just take her daughter for a little while until they can establish living arrangements. They've been at the homeless mission uh, for their 30 new audit days. They sleeping in their car, it's really not a good situation. They have found a place, but it's just very not safe. <laughs> so just pray that the Lord will turn this situation around and um, they get a good place to live. And for her to even share this with me was like, she's just a very, very private person, but she just started crying because she goes, we, we really have no place. We have no place we can get my baby in for me. So they're, they're just one of many, many situations, you know. Wish you could have a mission and open it up for all of them, but, <laughs> but um, just pray for this whole situation. She she almost had a heart attack for the second time the other night, just so stressed out with all of this. Taking care, just or take him to dialysis every morning at four o'clock in the morning. Didn't go to work as much as she's able to work. So, mm -hmm. yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Um, Keith said he lifted up because he wanted to have all the surgery last Tuesday, and they said a couple three days the swelling started to, in the meantime, she wasn't able to even swallow uh, her uh, other medication for the COPD that uh, we know that she's going to be healed of. Uh, so since she wasn't able to take medication for four, four or five days, uh, her lungs started filling up and everything else. So she's dealing with that. She started able to start taking the medication again. Um, so if she didn't understand and was taught how to have controlled breathing, I'd have her in the hospital right now doing exasperations on her lungs right now. But mm -hmm. um, just pray for her, uh, believing in her healing uh, from all these things. And oh, she, she, she really misses being here and, and uh, asked us to lift her up, and that's why I was going to lift her up anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so please do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. If we can believe him, 
know, that's the key. If, if we can just believe all things are possible, that God mm -hmm. wants to do more, yes. more than what we can ever imagine. So yeah. I just encourage everybody, this time of the year, just, mm -hmm. just believe God. It can be stressful for a lot of people, yeah. but uh, God is able to do more than what we can imagine. Mm -hmm. so, whether it's health, whether it's uh, relational issues, whether it's finances, whatever it might be. Let's remember Myron. Um, yes. Anybody that um, would like to help him out, he's still not able to work. He's got another doctor he's been going to, and I guess there's a vas vascular specialist that he's going to go to that's going to try and help increase the blood flow to the wound so it'll heal faster. Mm -hmm. um, so he is still not able to work, and there's an envelope back there for anybody that'd like to kind of help him out in the meantime while he's not working. Um, I think his basic needs are met, but you know, food and other things that are just highly, barely above basic. <laughs> um, yeah. He's struggling a little bit right now, so. Yeah, whatever you can do, it doesn't, I mean, we're not asking for people to do sacrifice. Right. Anything you can do to help him out, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll appreciate it. Yeah. He's got another surgery coming up at the end of the month. Yeah. It's a laser surgery on an uh, uh, artery or mm -hmm. uh, blood vessel mm -hmm. uh, to help the blood flow to that area so that it can heal faster. But, yeah. Um, yeah, so anything you can do to help out, mm -hmm. you know, may only be a few bucks for you. That's a few bucks that he doesn't have. stand and go to the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning as we've gathered together in this very cold day, Lord. We've come together to lift you up, Lord, to send our requests before you, Lord, to lay down our burdens at your feet, Lord, and know that you are more than able, that you have finished the work, Lord. We put our hope and our trust in you in all of these situations, Lord, the needs, the needs, Lord, of your people. Jesus, for the mother that lost her children, Lord, comfort, provision, Lord, peace, Lord, for the illness and disease, Lord, that you touch the bodies, Lord, that need healing, that you give the peace where the worry and the fear want to come in, Lord, that you give peace and focus and wisdom, Lord. Jesus, the members of this body who are not here today, Lord, minister in their homes, Lord. Let them know that they're missed, Lord, that they're part of this body, Lord, that they are missed, Lord. Those who we have not seen for some time, Lord, let them know that they are loved and they are missed and minister to them in the midst of their home, Lord. Lord, and we speak, we speak to cancer this morning. We speak to death this morning. We speak to loss this morning. We speak to poverty this morning. We speak to pain this morning. We speak to so many needs, Lord. But we speak to these mountains, and we speak life. And we put our hope and our trust in you, Lord. And you said it was finished. That it was finished, Lord. We speak to homelessness. We speak to addiction. We speak to those who have lost hope, hopelessness, Lord, those that are contemplating suicide, Lord, who see no avenue past where they are right now, Lord, who don't see the answer, who don't see the window, who don't see the door, who don't see the path, Lord. Light up a path before them, Lord. Your word is a lamp unto our feet, Lord. Let your word encourage. Let your word guide. Let your word bring wisdom. And if they can't find the word for themselves, then you bring the people to speak those words into their lives. You bring the believers, those who will speak life and love and peace and joy into their lives, Lord. Everybody is carrying this weight of darkness, Lord. That This dark night has been hard on your church. But we know that you are good. That you are good. And that victory is always where you lead us and guide us. That there is always a way through, Lord. And that in the midst of it, you never leave us. You never forsake us. That you make a way. You make a way where it seems impossible. If it doesn't come in an instant. If it doesn't come in an hour. If it doesn't come in a week. 
If it doesn't come after 10 years, we will still believe and we will put our hope and our trust in you for you are faithful. Your word is yes and amen. Every promise is yes and amen. Reconcile and restore, Lord. Reconcile and restore the health, the finances, the, the homes, the jobs, the family, the souls that have been lost, Lord. Reconcile them and restore them and renew them with new life. As we speak to this darkness and say, let there be light. Let there be light in the darkness. A candle is enough to guide the way, Lord. One matchstick in the darkness can light the way, Lord. Let us be light in this darkness until you set it ablaze for your glory. Until you set this world ablaze for your glory, let us continue to be light and salt for this world. We will not be silenced. We will not be discouraged. We will press on to the mark of your high calling. We will not lose hope. We will not lose faith. And we will not lose one soul around us, Lord, that we can have an impact on. We will do what we can do. We will speak where we can speak. We will help and give where we can give. But we will not lose hope. We will not lose the vision that you have for this body, for each of us, Lord. You have a purpose and a plan. You have called and chosen every one of us. Renew our vision, Lord. Renew our vision and our purpose, Lord. Remind us the gifts that you have placed in us. Let us stir up the gifts as a body and pour out. Because as we pour out, you continue to pour in. And as we pour out, you continue to pour in. And this world changes. The lives of those around us changes. And in the process, our lives change. Our minds are renewed. Our hope is restored. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for this safe place where we can gather together. I thank you for a pastor who listens and, and listens and takes your lead and your guide, Lord, and who loves truth and who loves grace. And I thank you for our pastor and his family, Lord, protect them, watch over them. The leaders have taken it hard during this time, Lord. And we ask the blessings to be exponential for those who have made their life your vision and your purpose, Lord. And for every member of this body, encouragement and vision, encouragement and vision, Lord, to hold on. The blessings are manifesting now. The light, the sunlight is starting to rise now. Let there be light, Lord, in our hearts, in our minds, and in the world around us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Praise. I feel like this is the surge before the victory. The Lord's blowing up the balloons, hanging the banners. We're almost there. But this is the final push to get to there. It has been tough. Thank you. Whew. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> it's almost as intense with that burden lifting. I don't know if anybody else feels it lifting, but it's almost as intense when that the, the pressure and the, the weight of this world is lifted. It's almost just it's almost as intense as when it falls on us. Mm -hmm. But it is lifting in Jesus' name. Oh, thank you. Let's speak the word this morning. Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Yes, Lord, let it be so. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every desert germ and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive.
receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Lord. Don, would you please come take that, Don? Take the offering this morning. Praise your mighty name. And as this year ends and the new year approaches, we yes, just Lord. really feel in our spirits that yes. something yes, great and mighty is about to happen. Things have already yes, happened. Yes. Things that we thought were impossible have transpired in these last months. So, yes. Lord, yes. we just look forward to every day with you. Yes, Lord. The old song says, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Yes. And Lord, we thank yes, you for the Lord. hope you give yes. us. The enemy cannot rob our hope. Yes. He may strip us of yes. everything else, thank but you. our hope is rooted and grounded yes. in you. Yes. Yes, Lord. And we thank you for that. We praise you for that. Now bless this offering, oh, Lord, God. and we'll give you all the honor and glory and
Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your gift. Thank you, Jesus, that you've revealed yourself to us by your spirit. We thank you, Lord, that we've been privileged to know the true meaning of Christmas and the purpose that you've set forth as a result for life to be given, for lives to be changed, for you to be real and manifest in people's lives. We give you thanks, Lord, for every good thing in our life. We know, Lord, that you are the author and finisher of our faith, our lives, and our eternity. And we give you thanks now and forever in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. And everybody said praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. And I dismissed the Sunday school kids, but there aren't any, so we don't have to. Praise the Lord. We've got one, but John has that under control, so. Thanks, everybody, for coming out and braving the cold. Normal Iowa. Praise the Lord. And I know next week I I didn't I haven't mentioned it, but only because I the schedule hasn't changed any as far as uh, next Sunday service, and I understand how that can be a real problem with everybody trying to deal with families and everything else. But because there's no way we're going to be able to make it work for everybody, we're just going to go ahead and have the Sunday morning service. And those that can be here, that's great. If family demands and travel and whatever else uh, may take you away, well, our prayers will be with you. And we'll just go ahead and have our regular Sunday morning service. Because no matter what we did, if we tried to have it on an evening service or an early morning service, we'd still have conflicts. It's just that time of year where we know that's the way it is. And the older we get, the larger our families get, the more extended they get, the harder it is to cover all the bases without offending somebody or, or creating issues. So we certainly understand it. And uh, more importantly, God understands. Hallelujah. One of the reasons he came was to unite families, to bring families together, to make them stronger, to make them more intact and, and healthy and functional. Amen. So it's only right that we should honor him and celebrate his birth in a way that uh, that promotes the family and uh, presents God in that in that relationship. So thank the Lord. Amen. God bless all of you again for being here. And I'd like to just get right into the word this morning. And I appreciate Suzanne talking about wisdom and and uh, that's what I really want to talk to you about this morning. And uh, pardon me if I'm if you hear a rattling going on in there. It's not my teeth. It's uh, it's a cough drop. Praise the Lord. I'm trying to keep floating around too much. But I want to start with uh, 1 Kings chapter three and uh, verse nine and twelve. Not nine through twelve, but just nine and twelve. First Kings chapter three, beginning at verse nine. This is, this is uh, talking about uh, Solomon who had uh, prayed and God had told him, ask anything you want and I'll give it to you. So he asked for wisdom. And of course we know that God did give him his wisdom and he was the wisest man ever uh, from the bi biblical uh, truths. But he also gave him everything else that he didn't ask for. So... Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge this thy so great a people. If you drop down to verse 12, thank you. Behold, I have done according to thy words, lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. So wisdom is what he asked for. Wisdom is what he got. Now Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Ephesians 1, 5 through 8. 
having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. And now Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now, <clears throat> I think part of the problem with uh, Christianity today is that most Christians still believe that it's something we do. They believe it's something we do instead of something that we are. You know, uh, for a detective... A surprise party is the ultimate insult. <laughs> and I think somehow that's Christianity to a lot of people. We're trying to detect and figure it all out, and God's just given us a surprise party. It's just me. It's just me blessing you. And, and, and I think that irritates some of us detectives. <laughs> we want to figure it all out, and there's, the only thing to be figured out is his love for us and the relationship that he wants us to have. And so when we ask ourselves, how, how can I be a better Christian, we tend to focus on morality and behavior. And we think about habits that we need to break or relationships that, that we need to do away with. And the focus should be not behaving like a Christian, but thinking like a Christian, yes. deciding like a Christian, Amen. planning your life like a Christian. Amen? You know, you don't need to be ashamed of who you are. That's your parents' job. <laughs> you know, so let God worry about it. You know what I mean? This is what Suzanne was talking about. There are so many people that are, they have problems. Well, who doesn't have problems? You know, I mean, some are op more obvious than others and maybe more, you know, uh, that we find more reasons to be critical of than others. But it's, everybody's got problems. My brother used to always say, uh, we have a dysfunctional family. If you have a family, it's dysfunctional yeah. by yeah. virtue of the fact that it has people in it. Yeah. Right. And people have a tendency to dysfunction from time to time. Right. doesn't mean we can't still be positive and, and, and have growth and so forth, but it's just a question of human beings dysfunction from time to time. Mm -hmm. And people need to know that God still embraces them. God still loves them, even in their dysfunction, even in their failures. So it's, we, the, if the emphasis is on doing things like a Christian, we never get to the place where we really are Christians. We're always in the act of trying to become something that God has already declared us to be. Amen? Amen. So Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 23 and 24. Ephesians 4, 23 and 24. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. He's the only righteous. He's the only tr true holy one. But we put him on. We become that. We, that is our identity now, right? So look at Colossians now, chapter 3, verse 10. Colossians 3, 10. Have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So we're supposed to, that's the, our knowledge. That should be our identity. That should be our awareness of who we are is him. The knowledge of the image of him that created us in the first place. Amen. So it, it's our thinking that determines our behavior, not the other way around. You can't make people behave well enough that they finally get some wisdom. You can discipline people all you want. They can still be idiots. Right. Amen. So everything we end up doing comes from what we know and how we put that <coughs> into practice. Mm -hmm. and stop doing Christianity and start being a Christian. Right. Right. And that's, I think, what God is trying to get, the point that God is trying to get across to all of us. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the wisest person who ever lived. Mm -hmm. Amen? And he isn't just spiritual, although he is God. Yeah. He's also very wise. Yeah. What what Solomon got was the Spirit of God. Now, he didn't have the Spirit within him, but the Spirit came on him. That, that, that brought wisdom. 
And that wisdom produced all the other blessings that he ended up with. And that's, that's, the, that's the true story behind that. It isn't like God gave him wisdom and then just gave him a bunch of other stuff. He gave him wisdom, and from that wisdom came everything else that God wanted him to have in the first place. Amen? So look at John chapter 14 and verse 9. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? See, when you see Jesus, you see how God thinks. When you see Jesus, you see how God responds, how God reacts to situations, to circumstances, and, and, and to people themselves. Godliness is so much of the time minimized to mean morality. To mean behavioral things. Morality is good. I'm not, I'm not against morality. But growing in godliness means growing in wisdom. Yeah. Amen. Just like Jesus. Amen. Look at Luke chapter 2 verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So did you know that when, when we grow in wisdom, we automatically grow in favor? Thank you, Lord. Now, what's favor? We know what favor is. It's grace. Yes. When God providentially works out preferential treatment towards you or towards me, that's something you can't earn. That comes from wisdom. Right? And the wisdom is of God. The wisdom that we trust in him and not in our goodness. Right. And the result is he, that, that grace expands. It, it grows. That's wisdom. The more we use wisdom, the more we understand and, and think in terms of the way God thinks, the more grace abounds towards us. John chapter 5, uh, verse 1 through 9. John 5, 1 through 9. These are familiar scriptures, but in the context of what we're talking about here, we know this is a guy at the, at the pool of Bethesda, right? He's been coming there for years. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water, Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. A certain man was there, which had an infirmity of thirty and eight years. And when Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. You know, it's really easy sometimes when you're going through issues, whatever they might be, whether it's health or finances or whatever, to get burnt out. I think that's part of what Suzanne was talking about, what we've been talking about this morning, is you've got, you just got to hang in there. You've got to have hope. You've got to persevere and continue to believe because your breakthrough could be today. It might be tomorrow. You know it's going to come because it's a promise from God. But too often we give up. We, we allow the circumstances or our situations to defeat us. This guy had been coming to this pool for years. He'd had this disease for 38 years, but it didn't stop him from coming back every year in hopes that somehow this would be the year. This would be the day. This would be the time, right? So out of all the people in the place that were needing healing, that were wanting healing, one guy gets it. Every year, he consistently made this trip to the pool of Bethesda, and he lays by the pool. Now, he didn't earn favor, but he positioned himself to receive favor. Yeah. He put himself in a position where he could have a miracle. Yeah. Amen? He believed, in other words. That's what he was doing, and that's what we do. We can, you know, we can talk about healing, and we're sick, and you know, people that don't understand look at you and think you're a hypocrite. What are you talking about? What are you, nuts? No. The only way I'm going to get healed is by believing for healing. Yeah. 
I can't just shut down and, and just act like, well, you know, I'm sick, so I'm not going to get healed. No, if I didn't get sick, I wouldn't need healed. Come on. <laughs> Praise the Lord. A fool will fumble favor. Yes. That's why God says a wise man will maintain it. A wise man will put position themselves for the favor of God. They'll put, put themselves in a position where they're believing God for their miraculous intervention of God. Yeah. If you don't do that, you can't expect God to do anything. Come on. Look at Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16. Matthew 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So wisdom is not IQ. You can have, and we know this. We, I, I suspect you know people with very high IQs, very intelligent people. Not a lick of sense. My dad used to say they were college-educated idiots. Now, he didn't have much of an education, but he was a pretty wise man in a lot of ways. You can't live, you know, any number of years without getting some wisdom, without getting some, you know, understanding of things. Amen? So, wisdom isn't IQ. Wisdom is believing the truth. Praise the Lord. Wisdom believes this. That's wisdom. You can be very wise and understand all kinds of about facts, but there's only one truth, and that's right here. Wisdom believes truth. That's what separates from the just the intellectual or the high IQ. Amen? Matthew chapter 7, verses uh, 24 through 29, Sheila. Matthew 7, 24 through 29. Now, I think Matthew 7 is a fascinating... To me, it's a fascinating chapter. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, and the wind blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority, or wisdom, and not as the scribes. Praise the Lord. So the whole chapter of Matthew 7 is all about dichotomies. It's, it's comparisons. There's the, uh, the chapter opens with Jesus, uh, and he's weaving this uh, web of, of conversation. He lays out these differences between a, a true prophet a false prophet, true disciples, false disciples, the difference between seeking God and judging people. Amen. He talks about two roads, a narrow road, the wide road. He t then, then he talks about two trees. One bears good fruit, one bears bad fruit. Then he comes to this place, to the two houses. And if you focus on the metaphors, you miss the point. Jesus is not so concerned about the cost of the concrete or the, the, the means by which it's poured and the, and the, you know, the, the physical a application of it, his, cur his, his real concern has everything to do with the internal foundational parts of these images that he's talking about, whether it's the two roads or the two trees, or in this case, the two houses. So Matthew chapter, if you could go back to verse 24 there, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Now think about that. He lays out two challenges here. And one, to get wisdom, you have to be exceptional hearers. Yes. He doesn't say you got to read more. He doesn't say you got to work harder. He doesn't say you got to be nicer. He doesn't say you got to fix it, get your act together and all that. He just simply says, hear, and you'll be wise. Second thing, he says, you have to put what you hear into practice. Now, going to school won't make you smart. I went to school for a lot of years, and I didn't learn a stinking thing because I wasn't paying any attention. I was hearing the same thing everybody else was hearing, but I never applied it to anything because I was bored with the whole thing, you know? It wasn't until years later, not that I ever got really smart, but it wasn't until years later that I actually figured out what they were trying to do. 
even if they didn't know what they were trying to do. Going to school doesn't make you smart. It's when you listen and you digest the information that's being presented and you digest it into application. That's hearing and doing. It's just like a job. You can know everything about the job and never be able to apply the knowledge in a way that it actually makes you successful at it. I mean, there are some people who probably know everything about plumbing and heating, Don, but they don't know how to apply it in a way to be successful at it, right? That's why a lot of them are employees instead of employers. But, and I'm not just talking about that, I'm talking about in any area of life. Unless you learn how to digest what you're learning or hearing and put it into a way that it becomes applicable or in a way that you can apply it to your job or to your life or to whatever it is you're doing, then you're not hearers of the word or I should say you're not doers of the word, you're just hearers only. He says we need to not just be hearers, but we need to be doers of the word. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. Luke 10, 38 through 42. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him unto her house. She had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was comforted about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. So if the devil can't make you bad, then he'll make you busy. Yep. If he can't make you unmotivated, then he'll waste your time by doing stuff that you don't need to do. He'll steal your focus. He'll get you hung up on all the peripheral stuff instead of the main thing. So it becomes working or resting. He says that we are to labor to enter into his rest. The only, the only work that we do is to get our minds in tune with his so we can enter into what has already been accomplished. Instead of us trying to work it up, to try to make something happen. See, the enemy's trick is aimed at getting you to expend your energy on stuff that doesn't produce any spiritual reality in your life. Try to get you to be the most moral person on the block. Try to get you to look a certain way, act a certain way. But it doesn't produce any spiritual reality at all. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being a moral person. I'm just saying we make the focus that and we never enter into rest. We never get to the place where we're, being able, where we're able to receive the favor of God, the blessing of God. This is called wisdom. Yes. To the world, it's foolishness. Uh -huh. But to God, it's the wisdom of God. Amen? Jesus says about the wise builder, he said, the wise man hears his sayings. Yes. The wise man doesn't hear everything that's being said. He just hears what God says. Yes. Amen? Martha was hearing everything. Got to get this roast in the oven. You know, hey, the potatoes are going to burn before the roast is done. Blah, 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 blah. And I need, I need Mary out here to give me a hand. Well, Mary had just decided that let the roast burn and the potatoes go raw or whatever happens. I need to hear what he has to say. And Jesus said that was the wise decision. That was wisdom. Amen? We need to concentrate on what God says. On God's word. His word over the circumstance. His word over the diagnosis. His word over the fear. Right? Amen. Filter words of faith from noise and human opinion. That's wisdom. Wisdom knows what to listen to and what not to listen to. Yes, yes. Wisdom knows once I've heard it, I need to now apply it. Mm -hmm. You can hear it. it. We can't stop hearing everything, but we don't have to apply it to our lives. Right. We can just let it go in one ear and out the other. But what God says is what we need to make applicable, what we need to apply to our lives in order for wisdom to take its place, in order for favor to increase. Amen? Amen. 
So wisdom and arrogance, which is what that is when we start thinking we know more than God, it's arrogance. It's actually idolatry. But wisdom and arrogance can't coexist in the same human house. It's a double-minded man who is unstable in all of his ways and don't think that he can get anything because he's like a wave of a sea. He's up and he's down and he's in and he's out. And that's why the scripture says not to be wise in our own eyes. Right. Now, here's a really deep word for you. You might want to write this down. God is smarter than us. <laughs> and we ought to act like it. You know, that's Christianity. James 1, uh, verses 22 through 26. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man that's beholding his natural face in a glass. He beholds himself and goes his way, straightway forgetteth what manner of man he is. This is what we, Suzanne was talking about earlier, right? right? Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, which is the word of God, and continueth therein, in the grace of God, in the liberty that God has provided, he being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. This is wisdom. And what does he say? That wisdom will bring blessing. Yes. It'll bring increase. It'll bring more favor. It'll bring more grace. If any man must seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. In other words, anybody who claims to have this relationship with God and can't shut up about the negative stuff that's going on in their life, their religion is in vain. It's, it's right. vanity because it won't produce anything except the negativity that they're talking about. That's right. right. And I know people say it. I hear it all the time. Well, it's the fact. I mean, come on. It's the truth. No. The truth is what God said. Yes. Those facts will never change until you agree with God and stay focused on what God is saying about it, yes. no matter what it looks like. That's called faith. Yes. Yes. We want just somebody, get the right preacher to come and wave his hand over me or, or say the right thing and everything's going to change. No. It'll change when you start believing what God says. Right. When you stick to it, when you hang in there and believe it in spite of what everything else is happening, you'll see the favor of God begin to flow. Absolutely. It'll increase. That's the way it works. That's called wisdom. You can be like David, wiser than all your teachers. I don't know. I don't think David had higher IQ because we know he did a lot of stupid stuff. But he had the sense enough to believe what God said when it came to mercy and to grace and to favor. And God blessed him as a result of it in spite of all of his ignorant stuff, in spite of all the stupid things that he did. Amen? David didn't try to be the most moral person in the world. It would have helped if he had tried a little bit. But you know what I'm saying? He wasn't functioning as a moral agent. He was operating as a believer in the promises of God, and God honored him for that and blessed him in ways that people that were very moral were not blessed. Very rigid in their religious activities, and yet never got the breakthroughs and the blessings that David had. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Wisdom bridles the tongue. In other words, it's when we start to say something that is contrary to the word of God, like this is killing me or whatever it might be, whoa, it just... Yanks the reins back and the bridle pulls you back and shuts you up for a minute. Yeah. Amen. Because it bridles the tongue so that we'll say what God says and not what we think. Yeah. Come on. Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Psalms 1, 1 through 3. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the word of God. And in his word does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. There's the result of wisdom. And I've learned over the years, I think... Pretty much the same thing everybody else thinks. I just stop talking when I'm thinking it. Because I know it's not going to help anything. It's not going to make me feel any better. It's not going to change the situation. I'm talking about when I'm, when I'm speaking to the, to, the, uh, is, to the issue that I'm dealing with, the circumstance, rather than speaking what God wants me to Because the, 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 the greatest uh, uh, temptation is to agree with the situation. 
to agree with the circumstance because it's the thing that's constantly bombarding your physical being, your humanity. Wisdom says, I won't say that. I won't say anything if I can't say what God is saying about it. If I can't agree with God, I won't talk about it. And not only that, I don't want to hear it from somebody else. I don't want to hear them saying stuff that's not in agreement with God. It's, it's negative. It's negative for them. Their words don't affect me, but their words will affect them. Mm -hmm. Amen? It's what, a, it's what a wise person does that prospers. Not what you're afraid might happen. Not what you're anxious about happening. But what a wise person does, that is what God prospers. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. It's not unbelief or lack of faith to have fear come to have concerns come about things. The lack of faith in God's eyes, the lack of, of uh, confidence in God comes when we start saying what that thing is saying to us yeah. instead of saying what God says about it. If your house is built on sand, then you're unstable. You're tentative. You'll be hesitant to step out and do what God is telling you to do. Why? Because you don't feel solid. You don't feel comfortable. You don't feel stable. Come on. Your mind is going to change like the weather. Yep. And depending on the circumstances, you'll alter your convictions to follow the logic of the moment or the situation. Mm -hmm. See, it takes faith to look out of my refrigerator. I've got a couple, just, well, I've got a lot of kind of stuff on there, a bunch of grandkids stuff and our own little things, but I've got a couple things, and one of them says, you know, faith is looking at defeat and declaring victory. Yep. Faith is looking at failure and declaring success mm -hmm. that's what faith is because yes. it isn't based on me or my vision it's based on what god's word says and he says that i'm more than a conqueror that i can do all things through christ who strengthens me yes, and most of us know that to be a fact because in areas of our life where we were total failures we've had success uh -huh. amen i mean successes have come even though we weren't the smartest, the brightest, the hardest, the, the, you know. But it just happened because we continued to believe what God said in spite of what our own hearts and minds were telling us and maybe even other people around us. Because your mind is going to change depending on your circumstances. You'll, you'll alter your convictions to follow the logic of the moment that you're in. It's only logical that I ought to say, you know, I got this thing. Why? Because I got symptoms. I got all this other stuff. That's just logical. It may be logical, but it's not wise. Uh -huh. Right. I, I love that, uh, you know, in Indiana Jones and uh, what is it, the Holy, or the uh, Ark, what was that one? Raiders of the Lost Ark. What was it? Raiders of the Lost Ark. Raiders of the Lost Ark, and when they get to the temple where they have the old knight, you know, he's 800 years old or whatever he is there, and he's guarding the, the Holy Grail, the cup uh, that the Lord drank the uh, Last Supper with. And uh, he says, you know, choose wisely, you know. And, of course, the, the guy, the bad guy, he grabs this one that's all covered with jewels and looks like it would ought to be the one for a king and so on and so forth. He drinks it, and, of course, he just... You know, disintegrates and falls to pieces and, and what wisdom from the night he chose poorly <laughs> I mean if that wasn't the understatement of the year I just I, I crack up every time I hear it and it's, it, it's just another way of saying he didn't use wisdom right. he let his mind tell him uh -huh. rather than his heart rather than God leading him he just took what made sense to his own mind and it was a poor choice. Yeah. It was not wise. Amen. But wisdom promises a house that will always remain intact. You may have difficulties at times, but you won't collapse. Amen. Your life will stand because you're built on the rock. Thank you, Lord. And that rock is Jesus. Amen. The word of God. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. <laughs> You know, almost all of us have known people over the years, and maybe even we have at times, uh, had 
situations or circumstances where they were frustrated and, and things didn't work out the way they thought they should, and, and so they just give up on God and walk away. When they, all they had to do was just trust a little bit longer, right. just believe a little bit more, and see the breakthrough that God wanted them to have. Now, God hasn't given up on any of them. I mean, we can walk away, but God doesn't let us walk away. He, he, wherever we go, he goes with us. The problem is, this is a perfect example. They're not getting the benefit of God's presence in their life That's right. because they're not using wisdom. They're letting their own mind and their circumstances dictate to them. And because of that, they stop the flow of God's blessings and God's grace. Not because God doesn't want them to have it, but without wisdom, it can't increase. So let's be wise, amen, and see the blessings of God. Let's make this new year a year of wisdom, a year of God's blessings and grace increasing in each and every one of our lives so that we can give increase to the people that we come into contact with and they can see God and his wisdom in our lives. Amen? God bless all of you. Have a great week. Merry Christmas. If I don't see you on Christmas, and if I do, I'll tell you that again on next Sunday. Praise the Lord. But have a great week. Enjoy your families. Stay safe. And God bless you all. <laughs>